Hi everyone, welcome to the presentation today around personal impact and presence. And to be honest, um, I feel a little bit daunted about doing this subject because as we're talking about this subject, obviously you're gonna be analyzing my <laughs> personal impact and presence. And I think the first thing to start with about personal impact and presence is that this is not gonna be about trying to pretend to be someone that you're not. Because we've always, seen people and even maybe experienced ourselves where we are overconfident in a situation. And that's only actually to compensate for the fact that we are actually uh, got a lack of confidence behind it. And so this area of personal impact and presence, it's a matter of this whole concept of, we've got our intention, but is that the impact on the others? And are we adequately demonstrating and representing ourselves and achieving the outcomes that we want? So this subject is absolutely fundamental. There's a whole day program, even a two day program that I do on this, and I've kind of consolidated a lot of the, the learnings and the theories and stuff to do this in a condensed uh, period of time. So if you watch this, if there's any queries or questions, uh, please uh, reach out because literally your impact and your presence is something that um, impacts you every single day, every single area of your life with your children, with your partners, with your stakeholders, with people that you meet in shops, uh, long-term relationships where you want to um, shift the dial on them, for instance, uh, business relationships, strategic relationships, everything can be made more efficient if you concentrate on your general personal impact and presence. So let's get into it. Um, as we go through today, I want you to always consider the cycle of change. What new insights do you take out of the presentation uh, today? And it may be something that I say, or maybe something that I say that triggers a thought about something else for you. So get a journal, get a piece of paper, or write notes down electronically as you do it. I'm a fan of paper and pen, to be honest. But make sure you've got a notepad. Go and get that now as I talk through these other ones, which is that through those new insights and learnings that you get today, what understanding do you take away from that? Therefore, what acceptance do you need to have? Maybe one of the acceptances is that we're not actually showing up and being the version of ourselves that we think we are. E.g., when I do recordings of people, they're always shocked. <laughs> for instance, for me, <laughs> I think that I sound okay when I'm talking, but <laughs> when I watch any videos of me, I, my voice, I'm like, man, do I actually sound like that? And the answer is yes. So it's actually something, some acceptance about who we actually are and leveraging our strengths to just shift the dial. And so we need to have some humility but not beat ourselves up as well. Because acceptance is about having genuine acceptance about the truth of what is, not kind of beating ourselves up or kind of uh, uh, rating ourselves, just uh, doing it without judgment in a way, just a true acceptance to then, what is the strategy that you need to have and what are some actions? And I'll give you lots of ideas of actions that you can take away from today to do things differently, to get a different outcome, and then obviously sit in observation, reflection, and inspiration around what you gain from doing those things differently to get new insights, to get new understanding and go around that circle. So the first question is this, what are impact and presence? And so I just want you to think about that concept, about, you know, what is it? Um, what, what are these things, you know? You've got a, a bull in a, a china shop there. Um, for instance, obviously having an impact. Uh, my mum always used to say that she always goes uh, everywhere twice. First, per, uh, first time she goes there and then the second time is to apologise. So it's a matter of having an impact, but is it the right impact? And what's the difference between impact and presence? And so there's these two things that are subtly happening for us and subconsciously we're evaluating everyone else that comes into our world. And so we're going to debunk some of that. So if you're not sure what impact and presence are, or you've got an assumption about what impact and presence are, we're really gonna unpack what they are, and what is that subconscious um, evaluation and judgment that happens for people so that you can understand that and so you can apply it more productively. But it really is, um, when I ask this question a lot of people, uh, people say, well, it's the impact that you have on other people and the impression that you live, uh, that they, 
that you leave with them. It's the, the command and control that you can have within a room without kind of directly expressing it. And so it really comes down to that influencing uh, capacity and about how you hold yourselves and some of these kind of things. And then the next thing is, why are they important, for instance? Um, I always forget the name of um, the guy on the left there. I know it's Leonardo DiCaprio. He's in the film um, Wall, Street, uh, Wall Street, Wall Street, not Wall Street of China. Um, you know the film. Um, <laughs> where He's very influential, but he uses his power for evil, uh, not, not good. Um, so why is impact and presence important? I think this is one of the subjects like influence, but even maybe even more so than influence because everyone, it's scientifically proven that we judge everyone that comes into our world within a matter of seconds. So everyone that you interact with on a daily basis is doing that judgment. So if you want to improve any area of your work life, professional life, career, and um, personal life, etc., that Let's go with one of the common factors across all those different situations. And so it is about achieving the ultimate outcome that you want. Because if you focus on impact and presence, that builds trust and confidence, that builds clarity, and then that leads you to the results that you kind of want to achieve. So ultimately, why is it important? Is because it is more effectively achieving the things that are important to you, working with others and bringing them along on the journey. So if you don't believe me, here's some examples. There's lots and lots of work out there about this, that executive presence is one of the key attributes and capabilities that needs to be built. There's lots of research uh, being done into it, and I'll give you share with you some of the latest uh, research. Um, there's another article uh, here about leadership presence is a top priority um, for leadership. And one of the reasons why this and influence are some of the key subjects is because it, traditionally, we, we worked and we had a manager and we just reported to. Now we're in matrix organizations where we have to work alongside a number of people. We don't have any authority over them. We might report to two separate people. You know, it's, it's very, very complex now. And how do you achieve better results? It's, well, you need to have impact presence and influence with these multi-stakeholders to achieve outcomes without authority anymore. And so it's a lot more complex. Um, but the things we go through today will, will really help. Where does this fit? It very much fits in that leadership impact. It's aligning your intention and your message with the impact that you have on people. So it's absolutely pivotal there, but it, it can very much unlock things down here because it can be a hidden obstacle for people because they may be thinking that they're having a certain impact, but they're not. And um, just by focusing on this subject can actually remove a bit of a hidden, um, hidden obstacle for people. And, but yeah, very much focused on the leadership impact side of things. So I want you to consider at the moment, um, rate your presence and impact. Um, and just consider that for a second, out of 10. Then you might wanna evaluate presence and you may wanna uh, evaluate impact. You might wanna do it. Uh, some people kind of go, well at home, in my home life, I'm probably this, but at work I'm this. And just consider it because how do we improve in any particular area? We actually shine a light on it, we become focused on it. And that's a new insight of just becoming focused on these two words of presence and impact. And just think for yourself what it is. I know for myself, sometimes I really want to have an impact and it just doesn't work for whatever reason. And it's even, you know, like the, uh, you know, the tennis player there. Some days, even though he's a professional, this is all he does, he plays tennis, he will get on the tennis um, field and sometimes he knows that it's critical that he performs, but he doesn't and he loses the game or the Grand Slam or whatever. And it's the same thing for us. Sometimes we have the intent that we really want to operate like this, but we don't, and it's just not our day. And other times we sometimes surprise ourselves that we perform really well in a meeting. We just go, yeah, that was so good. And it's because you nailed uh, some of these things. Um, and equally, you might be a little bit less confident uh, about these things, and you know it's something you need to improve, but you never know, never knew how to. So I'm going to be going through that, going to be going through that now. Uh, lack of presence and impact pain points. So I want you to think for yourself, where has a lack of presence and impact actually negatively had consequences for you? Um, I think there's nothing more frustrating than being in a meeting with a group of people and you just know that you're behind the eight ball straight away because no one's really listening to you. 
and literally can feel like it can feel like that is and you can blame them for not listening but how can you increase your presence and impact so that you command the room so that people listen and you have the impact that you want and get the outcome that you want it's really that's the key pain point around lack of presence and impact you know you take it to my children you know sometimes i have presence and impact with them and they do what they're told and um or we engage, you know, really effectively. And other times, you know, like the rest of you, I tell my kids to do things three times and they're still not listening. And at that point I go, okay, what am I doing wrong? Um, because if I was doing this effectively, they would kind of listen. So children are always the best uh, practice for most of us, to be honest. So the key thing, like I said, every single person around us is judging and evaluating with you in a matter of like three seconds. So we're always making an impact on everyone through the eyes of others about what they see about us. And it can be that we're walking down a road and we don't even interact with that person, but that person's on the other side of the road. For instance, when Hannah and I first met, I noticed her crossing the road and, uh, well, sorry, she noticed me crossing the road and I didn't even know she was there. And then later on, I saw her at the bar uh, talking with some people and I noticed her and she had an impact on me, but she didn't even know it. And so we're having an impact on people when we don't even uh, realize it, for instance, through our actions and behaviors and how we're holding ourselves uh, every single minute of the day. But the key thing is, is it the right impact? And funny story, actually, I wasn't going to say this, but the impact that um, uh, Hannah saw me uh, in the street and was interested in me and I kind of stood out because I just freshly shaved my head. And then I saw her at the bar with a group of guys and the impact on me was that she was taken. <laughs> so, but in the end, we end up getting married and, and everything. So it worked out. But the initial impact on me wasn't the truth. Um, there's a bit more of a story there. I can uh, tell you all personally about what happened because there was real intention and impact misalignment between the two of us. But we managed to sort it out, which was really uh, quite amusing when you look back at it. So you're always uh, making an impact but you leave an impression with the person. So you can have that impact and then when you walk away, that impression that you still left for them. So that's the lasting kind of footsteps that you see there. The impact kind of goes in and then the impression just gets left behind, which is the, uh, so even for me talking with clients and people sometimes, we have an impact in the call and I think that we're gonna go ahead and do X, Y, and Z and then I follow them up and they say, oh look, I really feel now that I wanna do something different. And that's because there was an impact, but then the impression might not have been exactly what I was on the same lines with. And so we've always got to be careful of impact and the impression that we're, that we're leaving. Because it's the, pressure, the impression that greatly influences what you're able to achieve. And so my example there is I think that we're going to achieve, you know, a client coming on or whatever. But the impression that I leave with them is different to what my intention was. Therefore, they might say, no, they want to do something different. So I need to go back and re-clarify intention and impact and is that right from yes, no or indifferent. So that's where impact to impression to, to, to achieving the result that you want. You need to actively manage this perception that others have of you because if you don't, you can't afford to leave it up to chance. If you're leaving it up to chance, you know, I suppose that is a strategy at the end of the day, you could leave it up to chance but actively know that that's what you're doing. But I would say that if you want to ensure someone feels that they feel loved, then have that as an active uh, driver for you. And I believe principally about consciously making decisions and actively uh, kind of going about it. Uh, but not just doing action for action's sake, make sure it's aligned with you uh, and then kind of going ahead uh, because you can't afford to leave it to chance is, is, is my view about things. So impact and presence. It's not what you have, but what you do. So uh, some people kind of feel like you've either got it or you haven't. Uh, their skills, not talents, you can actually train in some of these things. Like influence, night negotiation, there's frameworks that we can use to break it down so that you can more consciously apply it and get some tips of achieving a greater level of impact. This is not about changing who you are. It's about making sure that you shine up in the best version of yourself, yeah? And they can be learned, which I'm gonna be going through now. So the first thing that I want you to consider, there's probably three major, four major things that we're gonna to do today. First of all, we're gonna consider what are the characteristics of leaders with impact and presence? 
We're then going to uh, look at a, a simple model about what gets observed and judged, and then going to give you a model about the increase in your impact and presence. Uh, a really simple model uh, around that, and then and then fourthly, going to be giving you a whole number of different strategies and things to consider that are tips for you uh, to do that as well. So that's the breakdown of those four things. So first of all, when you consider what's the characteristics of leaders with impact and presence, you might say uh, humility, you might say uh, strength, you might say competence, you might say uh, listening um, uh, skills. You might say, uh, I think I said competence. I forget which ones I say when I'm not when I'm not flip charting them. Um, but if you just think about it for a few seconds and just bullet point a few characteristics down, you'll pretty much have the list of the theory. Uh, lots and lots of research has been done globally. This was some uh, research that was done. Confident and courageous, authentic and genuine, articulate and persuasive, aware and adaptable, empathetic and receptive. Da 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 da. You can read them all there. So these aren't rocket science, but they're common knowledge, but they're not common practice. And what we need to do is we need to look at these characteristics and say to ourselves, yeah, what ones are the ones for me that are holding me back? Which ones do I need to focus on more to have the impact that I want? Um, the slides of this I'm going to put in the resource center as well so that you can, uh, you can uh, copy these down uh, in, in your own time. And there's the Bates's model of executive uh, presence, which I can't remember the, the basis of the, the study that was done to analyze uh, everything, but they came up with these three um, areas of character, substance, and style. But again, very similar words, authentic, integrity, concern, restraint, humility, practical wisdom, confidence, composure, resonance, vision, you know, having that high profile vision, appearance, intentionality, inclusiveness, interactiveness, and assertiveness. So there's a whole balance of these kind of words and the ingredients. And I actually say the attributes of leadership are actually unachievable because there's so many of these attributes. How can you be all of these things at once? But it's about picking for you which ones are the most important in a, in a particular situation, again, to get the impact that you want. So maybe um, write these down and pick out the ones for you that you really feel like are the focus uh, areas for you. And I'm going to give you a model about impact and presence so that you consider which of these characteristics you need to focus on depending on the spectrum of where you need to be for impact and presence. Uh, and again, these are in the slides in the uh, resource room for you. So let's get really real. Speaking with leadership impact, let's get absolutely practical and really basic as well, uh, because it's the, the basics, the fundamentals is where you really make change. So ultimately there is three things with impact and, and, and presence, is that when we judge someone, we're looking visually at them, we're listening to their vocal and their verbal. Yeah, so it's the visual, vocal, and verbal. So the visual is what they look like, um, and we judge quite a lot on people what people look like. Are they dressed, and are they acting and behaving in alignment with their surroundings? That's the most important thing. Because if you think about it, if you kind of go, well, in a ballroom, if a person started running up and shouting and, and, and jumping around and getting really excited, is that appropriate? You know, from a visual perspective, no, that's kind of not appropriate at all. But if they were watching a game of football, totally appropriate. Could be a business um, uh, function in a box, for instance. So they're still in business, but different environment. You know, they can they can dress differently. They can present themselves differently. But visually, we very much uh, judge people from the information that's kind of going in through our eyeballs. The the vocal is the the, the tone, the pitch, and how we're actually uh, speaking. And then the verbal is physically the words that we are using. So vocal is uh, around uh, the accent, the tone, the pitch, the uh, pauses, um, and the verbal is the, the words that we physically use. So it is these three Vs um, that we're judging. And so think for yourself, are these three congruent with you? And one of the big things about having leadership impact and presence, I find, is actually just slowing up a little bit more and being more yourself. Uh, that's uh, that's the, the, the key of these three. So these three are always playing out. So just have that as a model that's that's kind of locked away. Uh, I think they're 
they, they're pretty uh, self-explanatory. You can Google lots about how you can improve in these areas or more information on any three of these areas, but just realize that these are the three Vs that are always being, uh, always being judged. The thing is, people form lasting impressions in just a few seconds, as I've said, and there's two, uh, and it's the Harvard Business School, uh, did the research around the two main factors, and these are it, which is 80% of your impact relates to warmth and strength. Some people say, what's the other 20%? The other 20% is a, a whole category of, of smaller things. But 80% of your impact and presence is evaluated by other people's human brains on the basis of how warm you are to them and how strong you are. So it's this kind of balance between these two things. Um, so this is the second key model. So we've got the characteristics, we've got our visual, vocal, verbal, and then we've got this, which is about warmth and strength. And I'm going to talk about how the other two kind of uh, come together um, with this about how we can improve our impact because 80% of it is just on this warmth and strength kind of aspect, okay? So um, Amy Cuddy from Harvard Business School, when we form a first impression of another person, it's really a single impression. We're really forming two, yeah? It's not one, it's actually two. We're judging how warm and trustworthy the person is, which is that human connection. One of the fundamentals about humans is we want connection. And we're also trying to answer the question, what are the person's intentions towards me, which is the strength uh, uh, kind of um, com comment down here. How strong and competent is the person to do what I need them to do? Um, or are they overstrong? Are they overwarm? So we'll have a look at a little bit of a graph about being um, getting the right balance between these, uh, between these things. The judgments, the judgments we make of others are rarely conscious and deliberate. Like I say, 90% of your thoughts, actions, and behaviors are run by your subconsciousness. So that's where delving into a model which happens in people's subconsciousness, which is really, really powerful. These are snap decisions uh, and judgments that are made, like in a matter of seconds. So if we can be more conscious about it, we can, uh, we can help with the impact that we have on other people. If you want a bit more information, there's a couple of uh, very good uh, books here, uh, Connect Then Lead. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Presence, that's another uh, good book by Amy, Amy Cuddy as well. You can get uh, Harvard Business Review articles on some of this stuff uh, uh, as well. So definitely do some, some uh, more reading. And there's also just some really good articles there, Strength Versus Warp, The Balance of the Best Leaders Find. And because this research shows that 80%, now you've found a lot of other people writing about this subject, so uh, feel free to do more reading at your leisure. Um, so if we've got these two areas of focus between strength and warmth, <laughs> sorry about the H moving over, um, where they collide is what your impact and presence is. So however you get that balance right is what your impact and presence will be. And you can leave it up to chance, or you can be more purposeful about it and consciously choose the impact and the presence that you want. So how do we, uh, well, I'll get onto that in a second, but this is what I'm saying around, you can be too strong and if you're not warm, for instance. So if you're really, really strong, but you're not warm to other people, you will create envy in them and fear because you're just false, 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 no connection with the person. Or envy can be, oh, look at that person doing all that and they're envious of the person striding uh, forwards, not having due regard of other people. And um, where we have people who are really, really warm and lovely and oh, and everything else like that, but they're not strong, those people tend to get taken advantage of because they're not strong. Therefore, we kind of pity uh, those people. And then when we have people who aren't warm to us, who are disconnected with us, and they're not strong and they're weak, we can kind of have contempt for them because they're not just very nice to be around. There's there's nothing to kind of work with. Whereas the opposite is admiration, where someone is, you know, you talk about leaders of the time. These are leaders that actually connect with the hearts and minds of people, but also give them the confidence and the strength that they're going to achieve it. And so it's this balance of things that admiration is, is kind of the focus, which is being the executive uh, versus inspirational leaders. 
very much need to sit up in that that top quadrant um, up there, which is you've got the strength to deliver, but also you're connecting with people's warmth because if you're just strong and not warm, people think that you're just there to take advantage of them. But if you're just warm without the strength, they go, well, he's a nice guy, but can never achieve anything. So uh, it's a matter of, of being, being up there in the, the top right-hand quadrant. Uh, again, lots of uh, research and, and, and uh, other, other reading about this um, that, you can, that you can do. It's a really good subject to, to do a bit more on. Um, key thing is, if you don't sound and look like you're confident, they will think that you're not sure. And if you want to focus on confidence, we've got the confidence training in removing hidden obstacles as well, which this one does kind of link with. So you can watch, uh, feel free to go back and, and watch that one as well. So we've got this strength versus warmth and we've got a spectrum. So think about the words, the characteristics that you look in someone where they're commanding strength. What do you think we look for? We're very much looking for competence, that they're strong and they're intentional and they're focused and they uh, they excel and they can actually give us results and, and give us what we need. And so these are some of the words that we've got over here on strength that you need to be demonstrating. Confident, authoritative, competent, knowledgeable, assertive, intelligent, challenging, and powerful, yeah? Good list of words. But if you, all of that, without the warmth, you're gonna come across as a self-serving kind of a person that's only after the result and not connected with the, with the people. So what's some of the things around warmth that come up for you? So warmth, when we're feeling really connected with someone, we feel that we're listened to, the person's empathetic, they're connected, they have time. Um, they have presence with us and here are a load of words of characteristics to focus on the warmth end of the spectrum which is that they build rapport they have the time to do that they're a good listener they're collaborative they're helpful they're caring they're open compassionate positive empathetic and when I did the training with these um, very strong executives the other day someone came up with a word what was it um, was it compassionate uh, it was another emotional word um, that was about expressing love, basically, and, and real connection to others, which I thought was beautiful because it does need that. Um, and wherever you are is the trust. So it's not about all one or all other. And in certain situations, you might need to be warmer. Some situations may be more stronger. But realize trust is built up in every situation between the balance between these two. And have you got those balance right? Just generally speaking, which way do you need to come more? For instance, for me, I was more stronger and I needed to become more warmer. Um, and certain situations I need to obviously adjust and, and change as, as needed. But for you, just consider the different situations, the impact and presence you're having. Where do you need to kind of dial it up? Because for instance, if you're in the, the executive of the boardroom, you'd probably want to have a bit more strength rather than warmth. Still have warmth because in that environment, there's not so much warmth. And I found that if you express that warmth in an authentic way, people realize that you've got something a bit different about you. So it's still being about being yourself um, and not just living the expectations of others, uh, doing it the way in which you want. Whereas if there was a major uh, team challenge or issue, you would probably want to go to the warmer to connect with people uh, more, for instance. So again, the visual, vocal, verbal, how does this all uh, come together? Well, however you put those three pieces together with the warmth and strength, again, it delivers on the trust that we have in a person. We trust someone who's congruent with what they say and what they do, and it's consistency between all of these that we're really uh, looking for. So now what we're gonna do, communicating key message concisely and clearly, what do you need to consider? So what I'm gonna go through now is a number of strategies and ideas and concepts of things that you can do to be more effective. So they're the models and these are some of the tools and tactics and strategies to use to be more effective. So um, a bit of a smorgasbord of things. So write down the ones for you that you think have most, uh, most resonance. And the first thing in actual fact in having impact in presence is first of all forming a powerful coalition. So leading change and the stakeholder mapping stuff we do is that identify first, if you want to have impact in presence, identify first the people who for and against and actually build up a bit of a coalition before you do it. 
one of my um, training in, in, in around the boardroom was never put forward a motion that you haven't behind the scenes been working with or <laughs> people to be supportive. So when you say, I think we should do this, you've got someone saying, yes, I think that's a great thing. Um, that because they're kind of backing you up. So first of all, make it easy for yourself by working with people, building trust one-on-one -on -one to build a powerful coalition behind the things that you want so that when you put them forward, there is this strong impact around, wow, this is the really the way that we should go. So consider who's for and who's against and work with them individually behind the scenes. That's my first tip, um, why make it hard for yourself. Um, on the effective strategies, it's about being concise and precise, speaking with conviction and absolute certainty. So the assertiveness model that's in the influence, you start with your conclusion, you give three points of explanation and rationale, and then you ask a question leading people in the direction that you want to go in. It's about being concise. There may be 15 reasons why your recommendation stacks up, but there's always going to be a top three, and there's probably going to be one that no one can actually argue with. So just go with that one point, get people onto that one point or the three. It's about being concise. I always just bullet point things out. Okay, what's the main thing here, 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 and here that we need to do? Um, this is something we have to do. We need to move uh, forward without delay. This is an opportunity we have to take if we're going to maintain our competitive edge. Yeah, simple statement, very focused. We've got to move without delay because we don't want this, therefore we need to do this. Let's just move on rather than going around and around and around. Uh, have a convincing rationale with evidence. Like I said, the facts speak with themselves. And if you can draw it not to your opinion, but to say, I think we need to do something because our performance has dropped by 30% over the last three months and we haven't seen that on record. Very convincing. Oh, wow, we need to do something about it. And it's said not in an arrogant manner, but just in a factual manner. And also when we're talking about ourselves, it's also the, the facts speak for themselves. I've had 15 years experience of X, Y, and Z. I was educated at Thingy. I learned this and I got awarded this uh, for doing these types of things. It's, it's like the factual basis that substantiates things. It can be very, very powerful. You know, a couple of statements there that you can use. Well, let's take a look at the metrics. Let's see what the information's actually telling us. Uh, let's look at the data that's substantiating uh, the reasons for blah, blah, blah. So focusing on, the, focusing on the data. Balance your arguments with contrary opinion. Consider presenting your proposal as analysis. Let's weigh up the pros and cons here. I always say never, never put that you, a lot, I hear a lot of people going, we have to do this. I and mean, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't have to do anything. We could close up the company. We could, you know, stop this relationship right now. We could do any number of things. So when you ever feel there's one, there's always multiple options. And there's also lots of alternatives out there. And so actually be balanced with that to say, hey, look, you could go this way or you could go this way. And I'm feeling that this way is a better way of going and then use the rationale in the effective strategies before. But give them, because if you empower people with the control to make the decision, they will feel less threatened and then you can lay the breadcrumbs to influencing them along the right way. And you're leaving that impression that you're not someone who's just forcing your views on other people, that you're giving them the autonomy, you're giving them the respect and, uh, and uh, also respecting their role and their status as well by going, yeah, we can do this or we can do this. But my views are these about this uh, for these kind of reasons because of this on this side. And just being pragmatic with that is a, a really good impression to leave with a person because they're seeing you as a trusted advisor. Reduce and sim simplify and keep your point strong. Again, it, very similar to the other point. There are three reasons why we should do this. Uh, three is really key. I just kind of find if you do one, then people kind of come back with one. If you go with two, it's, you know, it's better, but three, uh, and I think there's some research done that if you give three points of rationale, it's like 90% likely. You've got to be careful sometimes that you're not uh, faking those three. I've seen people pick dubious just to get up to three, dubious points. Don't do that because people will undermine it, but be clear about the things, yeah? Um, too much detail uh, often confuses and overwhelms, um, so keep it simple, stupid. Um, the knowledge value chain. So down the bottom here, the data, the information, the knowledge, 
is what we tend to work on when we're uh, looking into anything or doing anything. We focus on the data, the information, the knowledge, because we you know, maybe want to recommend something. But when we're recommending anything to other people, they're not necessarily interested in the data, the information and knowledge. And I even have this with my wife where I start explaining, oh, I've looked at this and this and this and this. And she's like, Robin, get to the point. Because what other people want is they just want our intelligence to make a decision, to go into action, to create the value. That's where they're at. We've done the hard work in the blue. We need to let go of that and go, how do I translate my data information, knowledge and everything that I know into intelligence and express that intelligence so that we or they can come to a decision and an action to create the value. The green is the really, really powerful. This triangle is really, really powerful in this way. And so definitely use that because too often we leave a bad impression, not a bad impression, but not as an effective impression when we focus on the blue. It's about focusing on that green and we all get caught into that, uh, uh, we all get caught up into that trap. Um, other effective strategies, sell the benefits obviously. Uh, this will allow you to significantly improve the efficiency of your processes and make it easier to hit your demanding KPIs because we're drawn towards the benefits um, of the thing for a person. Um, so let's just talk about what a feature is versus what a benefit is. So the feature of this is something that it is. You know, an apple, it's low calorie. Great. So what? It's something that's that's factual, that it is, it is what it is. Uh, we always used to sell on features, you know, buy this computer that's got all these kind of gadgets and widgets and stuff. Okay, great, they're features. But what we're really interested in, what the benefit is. A benefit is what something does. So for instance, if you eat apples, you're gonna look better than the donkey from accounting at the end of the year party, for instance. It's actually, okay, I really want that now because this is what it means to us is important and that's where the value chain comes in. Don't just sell the data of the benefits, uh, the features, actually what value is that actually gonna give? What benefit is that gonna be? Not to you, but to the other person. And if you're considering the interests, wants and desires of the other person, you build great credibility and trust and impact and presence because they feel that you, you've got their best intentions at heart because you're focused on the benefits from them. Really key, really key concept, that one. Um, turn a feature into a benefit involves adding the phrase, what this means for you. So it just, if you just think about that, so if you're saying, ah, oh, this gives you X, Y, and Z, oh, okay, I've been into uh, feature mode. What this means for you is A, B, and C. It's the A, B, and C that's really important. So what this means for you is, yeah, key sentence. Uh, understand their decision-making criteria. Sometimes we um, we cannot have the right impact because we're thinking that the person's got the decision-making power but they don't actually don't have it. And it's far better not to assume. Relationships are made based on two things, assumptions and expectations. So don't assume anything, just ask the question. I'd just like to know, what's your decision-making criteria? How do you wanna go about making this decision? How do you wanna go about going forward? Just ask them that question to see which direction they kind of go in. How will they decide whether to say yes or, or not to this? What's the criteria they will use? Because then, again, you're un putting yourself in their shoes, which makes them feel that you're got credibility, their best interests at heart, and you're gonna leave a more positive, lasting impression with them. It's a question that I ask new clients, for instance. I say, what's your decision-making process? How would you like to go forward? I don't say, right, you've got to make a decision now, and if you don't sign up today, then the deal won't be there, because that's just using manipulative persuasion kind of uh, things for people. It's about respecting other people, and that's where you build, and that's the warmth thing, about providing respect to them and asking them how they want to go forward with things. Influence success lies in large degree in being able to see pictures inside people's heads. So if one, you can make sure that when you're talking about, use analogies, use stories. And I'm using these pictures, for instance, to, to, to demonstrate a story with you. So if you can get inside their head and paint a picture for them, they're gonna thank you because it's easier for their brain to kind of understand. But equally, if you're trying to understand what's going on in someone's mind, try and ask questions to uncover how they're seeing things in their own mind kind of play out. So ask for examples, ask, you know, what does that look like to them? Those types of things. Again, really good questions 
about uncovering what's going on for them, which means that they feel respected, heard, that you're really trying and that you're trying to put yourself in, in their shoes uh, to help them. And again, leaving a very good lasting impression. We spoke about um, selling the, the, the benefits uh, to people. And there's these two things, which are, is towards language and away language. So if you do this, good things will happen. If you don't do this, bad things will happen. So you do this with the kids, like, okay, cool. You can either wash my car and uh, I'll give you uh, $10, or if you carry on being disruptive, um, we're not gonna be doing the activity that we're doing tomorrow. You can do it with your staff. Um, the uh, concept of alliance contracting that I've got a background in, pain share, gain share. So if we both go into pain, we feel it, if we both go into gain. So we want more of that, we don't want that, we're leading that kind of way. And if you think about politics, how they, how they uh, do things, which is, this is what, well, politics is kind of a bad example. Well, no, it's a good example in some ways because it's, they use more away from language. You know, they, yet they uh, commentators always ask them questions. Oh, you know, minister, um, about your policy, about, you know, whatever, they start talking about the bad policy that the other lot have. I'm like, no, no, the question was about what you're doing, not what they're doing. But what they're doing is that they're focused on towards uh, language, which is, look, we don't want that, therefore you must want us. Um, but make sure that you're using a balance of towards and away kind of uh, language, because if you're always, oh, you don't want that, an away language, you never get into what's the actual benefit of going with you. But if you're all about benefit, people don't know what the downside of not going with you is because they don't know the away language from the, uh, from, the, from the other. So it's about being balanced with these two things. Um, pain and gain, like I said. Uh, so the book, Your Brain at Work, we, the research actually found that away from language is three times more powerful than towards. And that's why in politics, society says that we want them to run positive campaigns and just tell us about the policies that you want and everything else like that. Don't, you know, start having a go at the other party and everything. Just tell us what you really want, concentrate on that. But in actual fact, that's not actually effective because away from language is actually three times more powerful um, because uh, on the spectrum of things, we really don't want pain. If we can have gain, great, but we don't want pain. And so that's why that's three times more, more powerful. Um, may not be for you individually, but generally speaking, it is. But again, if you're always playing the pain game of, well, we don't want to do that, therefore we've got to do this, then it doesn't really inspire, uh, inspire people. And it's not really inspirational and high performance and everything else like that. Because yes, we can survive or we can thrive. And that's where the towards language comes in. Because it's cool, we don't want the pain, we want to survive and, and look, this is what we really want because we really want to thrive. We really want high performance. I want you to uh, leave this job or leave this relationship or evaluate our relationship as 10 out of 10 because that's what I think we deserve. So use it in, use it in that way. So a couple of pictures. You obviously don't want that in your working life. You would want more of that, although... Uh, if he dropped his device there, I think he would be uh, in trouble. And so it's, you know, away from that and more to that. And so paint pictures for people of, look, we don't want this, but we do want this. Even in the beginning of my presentations, you know, we don't want this, we do want this. Okay, cool. I get the spectrum and I get that I need to focus on this a little bit more. A um, couple of last things about inspiring and motivating. How do we win the hearts and minds? And I spoke about this a little bit, a little bit earlier. We persuade people through the cognitive thinking, but we motivate them and inspire them through their, you know, through their heart and the real connection. That's where the warmth kind of comes. And we persuade almost through our strength and we motivate through our warmth of the emotion. We can also motivate maybe through our strength, if I think about the army, where they just yell at you until you start running. So that's kind of motivational, but generally speaking, it's, it's that way around. How we motivate and get those hearts and minds, we need to be absolutely clear with what your vision is. That's the first thing. What do you stand for? And I've stood for the same thing that I stand for right now, which is helping people to be the best version of themselves. Started that by doing aid work in Africa to help people and have the greatest contribution. And I'm doing that, and I'm doing that very much today. So just be absolutely clear with what your vision is. 
And, and then when you're clear with it, have multiple forums of having conversations and how can you make sure that that's expressed, making sure that the vision is really simple um, so that people can pick up on it really, really easily. Using a metaphor, use an example, again, painting a picture for people is really, really important. And repeat, 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 say it, say it time and time and time again. That's why at the beginning of each of these things, we go through the model um, of uh, the change cycle and where this kind of fits, because it's repeating the vision of the alignment of all these key areas for people to really ignite internal power for each of us and achieve the lives that we want. Use every vehicle possible to constantly communicate. So in conclusion, there's two major things. There's the visual, vocal, and verbal that we judge when we see, and what we're really judging subconsciously, 80% of how we're judging someone's impact and presence with us is based on their warmth and their strength. Their warmth about how they connect with us um, and you know, just shaking their hand and how uh, integrity we have and how much compassion that we have, but also the strength we have. Can we actually help them with what they need can we be concise to the point and kind of achieve the outcome? It's the balance between warmth and strength that's the absolute focus for you. Thinking about all those uh, leadership characteristics at the beginning of the presentation as well. So if there's questions, feel free to reach uh, out to me any way uh, that you want to. If you're part of the program, obviously we can talk about these on the Solve It sessions. Um, you can also uh, raise any questions on this on our one-on-ones or just reach out to me via phone, email, etc. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers, guys. Bye now.